Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Chen Yue. I'm a tech writer for Ping West. Um, this is today's first panel, and we're going to discuss about AI again because we have to. For me, I felt just a few years ago, AI was this still moonshot idea. But actually, I was strong. Like from several years ago, it's already transforming like all the industries just without being noticed by us. So today, we have these four panelists who have been working very closely with the AI applications. So we have Sovita from um, the tech giant Oracle. She has been applying AI solutions to enterprises. And we also from Zhe Wen, he co-founded Google Chatbase, which is one of the most successful um, um, startup incubated inside of Google. And we also have Karen, she's working in uh, AI healthcare from Databricks. And we also have Zhang Lu, she's a very experienced investor. So she invested in industry AI, enterprise AI, and also healthcare AI. And he has been observing all the hot trends in the Silicon Valley. So today, um, um, we are going to discuss, since AI is going to transform all the industries, how can we keep AI on the track for good? And actually, it's relevant to everyone here because we need to prepare for an AI-powered future. So now maybe we start with um, Sulita. Could you tell us more about your um, AI projects? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, uh, thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, I def uh, as uh, Chen Yu mentioned that I'm from Oracle. So I'm part of the Oracle product marketing team for Oracle Cloud. And the area I specifically focus around is um, AI and machine learning, and but it covers wide set of areas. Um, it covers the platform, uh, um, business applications, which are infused with machine learning technology, and then uh, also our database, which is, uh, which is ingrained with machine learning uh, to kind of provide efficiencies to the IT organization, especially to enterprises, so that they can leverage the technology and get better benefits in terms of cross reduction, but also optimization of the IT infrastructure. So I'll talk more, um, but like, no, let me go through, let, let the rest of the panel kind of bring their expertise to the table. Yeah, so uh, um, at Chirpbase, we develop technologies and tools for, uh, to help contact center build uh, smarter virtual agents more effectively. So this includes um, the IVR phone call uh, virtual agents, like if you have ever seen the duplex demo uh, in last year's Google I.O., uh, that's a phone call uh, virtual agent example. And uh, also chatbots as well, like uh, when you are messaging a chatbot on Facebook messengers or Slack or uh, other kind of forms of chatbots, uh, for example, a Google Assistant, uh, Siri, or Alexa, they could be considered kind of uh, chatbots, but they are more for general purposes. Uh, while we are more focusing on uh, enterprise, uh, very vertical, specific use cases, and the last thing we provide is the uh, assistant, uh, assist tools for uh, human agents um, to help them better do their jobs uh, more effectively. Um, so we do this by uh, processing uh, tons of uh, chats data from call center. Uh, then we leverage uh, Google's uh, machine learning technologies and uh, we model, uh, eventually we model virtual agents. Um, but when we uh, started three years ago, uh, we didn't start off um, uh, doing this uh, automation for con contact center. We, uh, uh, around, it's around September 2016, uh, we started off uh, on a different, a slightly different product, uh, which is the chatbot analytics. And at that time, uh, if bot developers have incorporated our API into their chatbots, then we will have a dashboard to tell uh, uh, what's working and what's not working for their chatbots. Um, but like uh, under the pressure of uh, being a startup in Aaron Gen 20, uh, trying to find out the product market fit, as well as uh, like uh, the revenue model, then we after we process tons of uh, chat uh, data, then we pivoted into more automation for uh, contact center. So that's what we did in Chatbase. All right, hi, I'm Karen. I'm a software engineer at Databricks. And to provide some context, if you're not familiar with Databricks, it came out of UC Berkeley with the founders of the Apache Spark project. 
And so the work that we're creating is creating a unified analytics platform on which data scientists and data engineers can analyze big data, and that can include applications in AI. The work that I'm doing specifically is in healthcare and life sciences. A lot of our customers are in the pharmaceutical, hospital, personalized medicine space, and they have similar use cases when it comes to processing DNA data, RNA data, protein data. And how do we create a platform which it makes it easy to go from these massive data sets to insights that can be used for drug development and personalized medicine? And so a couple of the applications that I've worked with um, on customers is Optum. They have an application with a neural network that can predict whether you are at high risk of developing a debilitating disease in the next year. At Human Longevity Institute, they can predict if you're at risk of developing dementia in the next year or so as well using genomic um, analysis. And at Regeneron, they've also identified unique uh, gene mutations, which can tell whether you might have chronic liver disease. And so these are applications which are obviously for human health. And so, yes, AI can be used for global good. <laughs> Hi, Aaron. This is Lu. I'm the managing partner and founder of Fusion Fund. We also actually discussed offline a little bit that AI has been a buzzword since, I would say, four years ago. So sometimes we even joke about maybe seven years ago, we'll have founder came to me saying that, oh, we're all doing big data analysis company, big data company, and now they, they all turn to the AI company. So AI is everywhere. It's hard, it's hard as an investor saying that we invest in AI because it's across so many different industries, and our industry is trying to see how to better apply AI. So for us, we had a question. We also had to do lots of work to really figure out which sector, which industry could really be the one of the best for AI to show the full capability and really have this true application to improve the industry efficiency, which means not only a huge amount of data, but also requires high quality of the data to support AI application and better integration. That's the reason since 2017, we were one of the first VC firm in Silicon Valley start to focus on AI in healthcare, which also so leverage my previous life as an entrepreneur running my own healthcare company. We found out healthcare was one of the best industry to really show the capability of AI and also really give us the definition that why we have AI integration. It's not for disruption. Lots of people, when we talk about AI, think we use AI to replace doctor, nurses, replacement. Actually, the key concept here is actually to argument how to better integrate and use AI to make the existing player more powerful, more efficient, and uh, also could uh, leverage a uh, different type of platform. So we start with AI in healthcare. And later in 2018, we also did an industry research on network technology, uh, including edge computing and other like cybersecurity technology. That's when we start to invest heavily in AI in enterprise, AI in cloud as well. And uh, also since uh, 2017, because we saw so much uh, excitement happened in the industry automation. We we'll also invest a lot of uh, robotics application for supply chain automation, industry IoT. So that's the main focus of our fund right now is uh, enterprise tech, industry tech, and healthcare tech. Definitely leverage AI as the key engine, but also try to leverage other new technology to power the traditional sector to have this so-called fourth industry revolution. I see. Wow, so AI is like transforming all the industries. There are so many opportunities. So for now, there's more and more people saying we are standing at the beginning of an AI um, industrial revolution. But we all know in revolutions, there will be winners, there will be like losers. So how can we keep AI on the track for good? What are the challenges that also benefits on the way? I think like you, know, you have two questions here, like you know, um, in terms of one, like you know, how can we keep AI in check, and then, like you know, what are the challenges uh, most companies are facing? So let me um, talk about quickly about firstly about the challenges. I think being uh, at Oracle, like you know, which is an, in an enterprise space. Many of our customers do want to leverage these technologies and see they, they do definitely see a benefit uh, and um, in terms of how they can um, augment the capabilities of their enterprise um, in terms of whether it's about reducing cost or bringing new innovations. For example, uh, I think like we discuss about how um, healthcare companies are looking to um, this intelligence to provide or push the uh, frontiers of uh, healthcare and provide better service to the customers. But the challenges I think like you know, the, which most of the enterprises face are about how do they get access to the data. And I think the, that's one of the 
the biggest challenges for most of the organizations is do you have you don't only need uh, you need the data but you need the right data you need the clean data you need the data which is which meets the governance and compliance requirements of the countries or nations or, or your industries. So uh, the data, I think, is a critical piece, and it is a key foundation to doing AI right. And it kind of ties back to your question, like, you know, how do you put checks and balance to AI? Because the data you're feeding is, um, is going to give you the insights. And if you don't have the right data set, you're not going to get the right insights from the, the tool you're using. And so AI is more of a tool rather than, uh, I would say, anything else. Of course, uh, it's going to um, impact the jobs through automation or anywhere else, but it's definitely going to also lead to a new addition of jobs, um, new job functions and capabilities. I mean, who knew about data scientists like you know, many years back? Now you have such a high demand for um, uh, for professionals who can uh, who can be data scientists, and you don't have a, you actually don't have any degree in data science. Uh, you use uh, you if you are a background in mathematics, if you are a computer engineer, uh, you are a physicist. I have seen people coming from all the different backgrounds being in that role. So I think like you know um, to talking about how do you man like, you know, take care of uh, the ethics or other pieces. I think that the data is important and investing in solutions which can help you figure out whether you have a clean set of data or not is critical. And uh, I, I think that's where the, so every company who's thinking of bringing an AI-based business should think about the data strategy as a key element of it. So I think that's where it starts. But also like, you know, figuring out like, you know, the algorithms you're using. I think like you know, we at Oracle are investing a lot in terms of explaining, explainability of the algorithms. Uh, why is this particular algorithm better than the other one? Um, and also like, you know, how do you bring the element of, um, I think like there has been some discussions about fairness, um, all those elements in uh, building part of your machine learning models so that the data you're using, along with the algorithms you're using, are taking into account those aspects of it. So I just wanted to kind of add that. Yeah, I can speak a little bit more on the virtual agent side. Um, but I wanted to ask the audience a question. Uh, how many of you have uh, talked with the chatbots? Raise your hand if you call. And how many of you hate chatting with chatbots? A lot of them, as expected. So, yeah, I think it's for some reason you perceive your, uh, your, your issues too complicated to be handled by chatbots. Um, so the chatbot, you can see the chatbots too dumb to handle your use case. Uh, it's the same to one enterprise uh, we work with. So uh, that enterprise, they have 100, almost 100 engineers and other staff working on uh, uh, automation on chatbots for their uh, contact center. Uh, and they have everything ready. Uh, they are about to launch the bot, but eventually they didn't because uh, they are worried about a chatbot uh, uh, can bring a lot of failures, uh, not handling customers' issues, and this will definitely damage their brand uh, branding. So it feels like the problem in chatbot isn't uh, about automating by chatbot, but how smart the chatbot is. So when you talk about um, like the chatbot doesn't handle your issue, it really comes down to two uh, major challenges. One is the NLU, the natural language processing part, uh, which means if you express an intent and uh, the bot can the bot handle, can the bot understand your intent even if you phrase in 1,000 different ways of saying the same intent. Uh, that's NLU part. The other challenge is uh, the long tail use case. So uh, for example, if you are chatting with a chatbot to, uh, for example, to reserve a table in the restaurant, then there will be some necessary questions uh, that the chatbot will ask you. Like for example, how many people are you coming in uh, to dining? And um, and what time, what dates are you are you going to come? So that's the happy path. But in terms of long use, uh, long tail use cases, you look, you might be asking question about like, are there any vegetarians option? Uh, if you have toddler, uh, you will be asking about uh, are there any uh, high seats? 
Are there any parking lots? Are there any uh, blah, blah, blah? A lot of different long tail use cases. Uh, right now in the chatbot industry, if you don't have that use case built in your chatbot development, those will not be understood by uh, chatbot. So, uh, so what? coming back to your question, uh, for the benefit for uh, what chatbase our project does is we, uh, by analyzing uh, tons of uh, numerous data from call center, we were able to first uh, enhance NLP to have more accuracy, uh, weak core and precision. Uh, at the same time, we can handle a tons of different use cases uh, uh, being extracted from the data. So that's what we uh, bring a benefit for uh, the chatbot. So for enterprises, they, uh, they can build smaller chatbots uh, we hopefully we can automate 40 to 60 percent of all the use cases, in, all the use cases in the contact center. And for uh, individuals, when they talk with a chatbot, it's, it could be more smarter chatbot with better user experience. So I think that's what we uh, bring to the uh, benefits. Okay, so to go back to the question about challenges when it comes to doing AI, I think that it mostly comes down to how do you process big data? So to give a little more background on myself, I worked in machine learning algorithm development, and a lot of the work that I did in the beginning was, okay, I wanna run this process. It runs in a single thread, and I have this like school cluster that has four cores on it. I'm gonna split up this file manually and then run the process through on each of the portions. And that gets really frustrating once you start having these massive clusters and your data set gets bigger and bigger. How do you scale all of that? And the tools that are able to ingest the big data aren't always linked up to the ones that actually do the machine learning and the AI. So at Databricks, a lot of the work that we do on the unified analytics platform is to do an end-to-end -end solution so that you can ingest your data and then do machine learning. And that gets rid of a lot of the friction when it comes to setting up the infrastructure so that you can process your big data efficiently and get better results. Because as everyone knows, the more data you have, the better your statistical power. So the firms that I work with, especially in the pharmaceutical space, have these brilliant biostatisticians. And they end up wasting up to like six months at a firm just trying to ingest their data to get it to work for them. And when working with Databricks, we've had them up and running within two days and able to process these terabyte biobank scale data sets so they can actually come to real insights and use their talents for good. So I think that when it comes to talking about how uh, AI may be potentially dangerous, I think it's actually that AI just makes it more possible for people to get to the results that they always wanted to get to, but aren't able to get to right now. Just want to add to Karen's uh, comment here. I think that's one of the biggest challenges. Is like you know that's why I said the data strategy is critical because uh, apparently 80% of time is spent actually processing and finding the right data for most of the companies before even getting to the problem and fixing it. So um, so you need technology which can help you ingest um, huge amounts of data, process that data before you can actually build an algorithm and deploy it in, and use it. So so that's a very later in the process. So you have to think about the entire life cycle of uh, getting the data and moving it down the chain to actually building an application. So it takes quite some time. So you have to, that's why having tools and technology is critical, especially having a right data management strategy is very important. Just wanted to kind of add that. Just to continue the discussion about data, I think lots of the audience may wondering like we, why all of a sudden like data is so important and how could it possible right nowadays we got so much data? It's because just like a couple of years ago, we have so many low cost sensors being deployed in the industry. And we're generating data every day. I was saying that lots of people think you're not part of AI. You are, because we're the generator of the data. Data supports AI. But now with the sensor, the data was able to be collected. And then now with like a cloud computing, edge computing technology, data could be transferred over to the cloud to be processed and get back to you, even with no latency with edge computing to provide this personalization the services. So that's the that's the that's what's happening right now with technology without everyone really realize that you're part of AI. And back to the initial questions you asked about, you know, this replacement, this fear of uni applying AI gonna replace job opportunity. Uh, I totally agree with uh, uh, Samita that, you know, there's always job gonna be replaced, but there's always the opportunity, new job being created. If we really look back into the history, every time when we have a new technology came out, 
yes, in the short period of time, some people may lose job. But in the long term, more job opportunity is not the same amount. It's always more job opportunity going to be generated and also better improve the industry efficiency. Even, for example, if we just go extreme, like edge situation, if this time AI is so powerful that uh, we really don't need to uh, work too much on the original industry, then we're going to end up with a Star Trek. That's not a bad thing, right? We could be free and explore the universe. That will be possible. So that's the reason, like, when we heard, especially as an investor, uh, I always hear people talking about, OK, AI going to threaten the society, replace job opportunity. I'm like, first, you know, we may have more opportunity. Second, AI is not there yet. That's the reason we're discussing that AI is not ready for disruption, totally replacement. AI is trying to integrate to augment the existing player. Then the replacement may happen in the future, like doctor who use deep learning for, med like for medical imaging or medical imaging enhancement going to replace the old one. The call center who use NLP going to replace the old one. And the industry enterprise who use the AI to help the future of the work efficiency improvement going to replace the old one, become the new winner. So that's how AI going to work to integrate better with the, the current industry to power the efficiency. For sure, you know, on the other side, we need to think about you know, how to better do the regulation of the data, especially when we talk about we have so much amount of data. That's also something I recently been traveled around, not only like in the West Coast, but also spent relatively a huge amount of time in Washington, D.C. to better discuss what is the right approach for the matter government institute, our industry, to regulate the data instead of regular the AI. I think that's the mistake right now. The government tried to put regulation on tech, like AI technology, instead of really pay attention to the key thing, which is the data. I see. Um, so data is really this big issue. And so before we are re will be replaced by any algorithm, we still have some time to prepare for that, right? <laughs> we don't have the right skill set. So now we come to our final question. Since we still have some time to prepare for that future um, before it completely transforms everything. So how should we prepare ourselves for this AI-powered future, either addressing the, um, the data issues or to, so should we go to pursue data science? I start with my future career. Uh, I, I don't think so. I mean, like, um, this is just my personal view. Uh, we all have specific capabilities and we, that, that we bring to table. And um, there's not going to be that everyone has to be a data scientist to actually do it. Like, no, we still need engineers. We still need uh, lawyers. We still need doctors because that's where the source of information is coming from. And that's what we are building these systems from. I think like, you have to think about AI as a technology, as a tool, which can augment human uh, in their, um, like, you know, basically augment human intelligence to the next level. It's an evolution of humanity. It's not actually that we are going backwards. So uh, I still think we still need artists. We still need uh, people who are that creative mind because the, everything behind AI is a human brain. So you can't completely negate it. And uh, you have to keep that in mind too. Uh, as I said, you have to use it as a tool. And of course, as a tool, if you have a sharp knife, you're going to chop vegetables and cook nice uh, curry, or you can use the tool to kill someone. Uh, but uh, you have to figure out the, the way you're using it. So I think, um, I wouldn't say this we are completely lost. We still need our creative minds behind it and unique capabilities to bring to the fourth front. Yeah, so regarding to that question, also building on what uh, uh, Zhang Lu just talked about in terms of job piece, so there are some uh, ongoing heated discussions on like UBI, universal basic income from uh, one of the uh, Democrat uh, can, uh, presidential candidates, Andrew Yang, and also how automation can uh, eliminate a massive amount of jobs. So basically, when you zoom out the history, uh, just the same as what Alu uh, just mentioned, uh, there's no finite number of jobs. Like uh, 100, 1,000 years ago, there's all people, most people maybe uh, in every culture. And 100 years ago, uh, like there's no Hollywood, there's no movie theater, no TV, no actor, no actress. So, um, so when you, um, so new jobs will be created. So what I, my view on this is, uh, the technology will be. Uh, free people from the repetitive mundane jobs to a more creative jobs. So for example, when we are in chat base, uh, one distinction when we think of automation is that instead of thinking uh, how can we replace 
human agents, we think of how can we augment their capability, how can we expedite, expedite their workflow so they can do better jobs instead of replacing their jobs. Uh, so I think also uh, on the other notes, um, Google has released a Google AI principles and there, I think, I guess there are seven of them. One is uh, AI should be more, should be socially beneficial. AI should avoid uh, creating or penetrating uh, the un uh, unfair bias. AI should pref uh, should uh, respect people's privacy and etc. I think for people who uh, develop uh, machine learning technologies and uh, are working in corporations, they should be able to uh, refer to these principles. Yeah. So. When we're talking about how AI could be influencing people or vice versa, I'm thinking specifically about how in healthcare, AI is changing our lives already today. A lot of people might have heard about the BRCA gene by now, and if you have a mutation in that gene, then you're at higher risk of developing breast, breast cancer. And you may have heard that Angelina Jolie had a double mastectomy after learning that she had a certain mutation. So these are changes that people are already making in their everyday lives based on the impact of AI research in the healthcare space, which has been happening for years and years now. There are also personalized medicine efforts, so you can identify uh, your risk score for a certain disease based on genetic mutations. So I don't think that people should be afraid of AI. I think AI is all about how do we make it possible to do what we always wanted to do, and that's getting rid of the silos that separate data scientists and data engineers so that the people who do the statistics can do their jobs more efficiently. Just to add a little bit to what Karen just mentioned about AI's influence on healthcare, I think the one key thing like for each individual, like back to your questions, we need to do is to try to change our user behavior. For example, AI is playing an important role in the diagnostic area right now. And we used to think, okay, I go to hospital once a year to see whether I have early stage cancer or whatever. Now with the AI technology, it's a monitoring, it's a continuous process. So you'll be able to get continuous diagnostic result and be able to find out the signal of the certain diseases at very early stage. So technology is not only helping us to live a longer life, but also helping us to live a much healthier and stronger life to maybe 80 or 90s. And you don't need to spend the last uh, 10 or 20 years of your life lying on the bed, but actually still working hard on the, at a company. I'm a workaholic, so that's what I can imagine. So back to the question you said, what else we should prepare? I think other speaker really covered the key point. I just want to add one point. It's about self-education. Because nowadays, the issue is, the good thing and bad thing is the technology progression is so fast. We have so much innovation happening right now, quickly integrate with the industry. So the school, the education we got from college, not necessarily will be able to cover that to really help us better understand how we engage with the technology. Now, the key challenge for us is how we treat our digital asset, which also brings up, is a problem, our question brings up by AI. All of a sudden, each of us have so much digital asset. We used to feel comfortable that I have my iPhone and my computer and my house is my asset. But digital asset is also your edge asset. And AI is helping us digitalize the whole world, your life, your company, the whole industry, and who owns it. And whether you think about your ownership, how you better protect it, and when you realize that's one of your assets, then what's your attitude towards your asset and how to better use the asset is going to be totally different. It, which also back to the initial question I bring up, like uh, the regulation on technology, regulation on the data is truly important because everything has to be put into the box with limited freedom. Then we'll be able to use this neutral tool with its technology to really power the, the industry efficiency to do something good, like AI for good. So now I think, uh, personally I feel, because I was born and raised in Mongolia, so I'm not a, a local resident. I came here in 2010, so I kind of have this uh, more global view. I feel Silicon Valley has an issue that I always think about technology could resolve most of the problem which is not. So we need to engage more people, no matter from policymaker, from economists, or sociologists, who really came together to find out a better way to do this data asset regulation, which is going to give us more power to better use AI in different industry. Just want to add to Karen's thing is that like you know I think we all need to be participants in this, and it's just not the tech community here, but like you know everyone, whether it's a farmer in India or anywhere else, to kind of help provide like you know help so that they have a voice in it, uh, and like you know it changes the conversation. 
Yes, because today we, I guess we have a lot of engineers sitting right on, on the stage. So hopefully um, today everyone here, maybe we can come up with a solution so of this AI um, data issue in the future and we all can participate in creating a better AI for the future. So this will be the end of our discussion but just the beginning of all this AI future and all the work and we can do and what future we can um, build together. Um, so hopefully we'll um, work together to build a good AI future. And thanks for all, and every panelists joining this panel. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, audience.